Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, there's a battle looming in the House of Lords tomorrow, as we were saying, over the government's plan to tuck cat to cut tax credits, I beg your pardon. The Conservatives don't have a majority there, so it is quite possible that the unelected upper chamber could throw a serious spanner in the works, which would no doubt delight no one more than my next guest, the Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald. Welcome, Mr MacDonald. Welcome. Um, first of all, let's talk about tomorrow, if we could. Um, there are various motions down there. Would you regard the Labour motion, uh, which is for a three-year pause, in this proposal as in effect killing it off? No, I think it's a real offer to the government, uh, to George Osborne, to see if we can actually make sure people are properly protected. And then at the right time, if there's a way of reducing tax credits, of course, we'll, we'll cooperate with him in that respect. Is there something slightly embarrassing for someone like you who can't be a supporter of the yeah. unelected second chamber, relying on the ermined peers to stop this measure? Well, <laughs> not embarrassing. I've always been a person who... Have, I've never wanted a House of Lords as unelected, but I, I do agree with a revising chamber. And to be frank, this, this is becoming above politics. I, I've written to George Osborne today to say, look, this... Uh, I'm, I know what a U-turn looks like and how it can damage you, but we need a U-turn on this one. And so I've said to him, look, if you can change your, your mind on this, we will not pay, make any political capital out of this. So if the Lords do throw this out tomorrow and put it back to the government, I've said to him, if you change your mind, bring back a policy which, in which people are protected, not a political stunt, but a real protection, we will not in any way attack you for that. In fact, we'll support you. So that's, well, that's a very interesting offer. The House of Lords, however, may go the other way. I mean, we, we don't know, neither of us know what's going to happen in the House of Lords tomorrow. If, they, if the policy goes ahead, is that it? As far as you're concerned, the House of Commons has spoken. You don't like the policy, but it's going to go ahead. Or do you take this onto the streets? Do you start to get a big national, well, I national think, campaign I think we, against I it? I think we already have, not just the Labour Party, but a large number of organisations in civil society. Because we're talking about, well... People, these are people who go to work, look after their kids, do everything asked of them, and they're going to lose, on average, about £1,300 a year. 200,000 children could be forced into poverty as a result of this. So out there, right the way across society now, people are saying, this is unacceptable. Please think again, government. And we've said, look, we, it, please do, think again, change policy direction, and we will not criticise you for that. In fact, we'll support you. But this has huge financial implications. I mean, George Osborne expects to save four and a bit billion pounds mm. every year on this towards deficit reduction. So if, as I gather, you would completely reverse all of this, that's a huge amount of money for you to find from somewhere, isn't it? It is. But what we've said to him, look, if you could reverse your policy on this, what you need to do is start thinking about a reversal on the direction of your policy with regard to tax cuts overall. Remember, on Monday in the Finance Bill, he's going to force through a cut to inheritance tax, which is to some of the richest families in the country. It's it's the same on the top level of tax. It's the same on corporation tax. It's always tax cuts for millionaires, but credit tax, credit cuts to well, tax credit cuts to the poorest and some of the middle and low earners. Do you think this new one million pound ceiling on inheritance tax is simply too high? Well, I think it is at this stage. We can look at it again when the economy is in better shape, but you can't be in a situation where you're cutting the taxes to the wealthiest but then t cutting the benefits to some of the middle and low earners and poorest in our society. People out there just think it's unfair. I mean, you were elected as a radical shadow chancellor, or chosen as a radical shadow chancellor. We are now in a situation, there's a big new book out on class just this week, which shows that inherited wealth in this country is one of the biggest drivers of inequality. It's massively important. So I wonder whether you are thinking about a really big change to inherited wealth, some kind of wealth tax, some kind of revived yes. inheritance tax. Because if you don't do that, then these divisions are going to carry on. There was an excellent book pr produced recently by Professor Anthony Atkinson with regard to inequality. And one of the issues he's saying is we need to look at this whole issue. And one of the recommendations he put forward is what's happening in Europe at the moment, where you set up a social and economic council, bring civil society together to look at these issues. That's what we're going to do, because one of the issues we want to address is inequality and how we then seek prosperity for everybody, just not a rich few. But you're not really about reviews, you need a wealth tax, yes, don't you? Well, I think at some stage we'll be looking at a fairer taxation system, but we want to bring people with us, and part of that is explain just how unfair the system is at the moment. And the tax credits issue reconfirms that in people's minds. 
when it comes to the whole, the whole taxation system, you've said, you said in your speech to the party conference you want to get a lot of money from the big companies, the Starbucks's and so forth, the Amazons, not paying their full taxes. But, you know, politicians have said this for That's years and years and years. They have very, very clever accountants. Capital is mobile and international. It's much e This is slippery money to get your hands on. Very difficult. It is. I've been working... There's an element of crossed fingers about all of this. No, not at all. I've been working on this for 15 years. I was one of the first MPs that brought the tax justice campaign into Parliament. Mm. No one was listening to us at that point in time. I think we're winning the argument on taxation. I've also said we're going to review HMRC, our tax collectors, because under George Osborne, he's cut the staff from 70,000 to what will be 50,000. He's closed local offices. So they're undermining the resources of the very tax collectors that we need to bring this money in. He's accepted himself. The Treasury published his own figures, a tax gap of 30 billion. 10 billion lost through illegal tax evasion. I think we've got to clamp down on this and we need to do it seriously. Let's move to another big issue of the past week, mm. which is the steel industry. Now, um, you've been highly critical <clears> of what the government has done. What would a Labour government actually do now? Because it's a very complicated question. It's involving dumping from overseas and, and, and cheap steel, but it's also about the price of the pound, it's about the price of electricity, it's about lots of issues, most of them global. Well, we would have listened to the steel industry itself. The steel industry has campaigned now in recent years, and we've been supporting them, about working within the EU to stop the dumping. The government hasn't done enough to actually bring forward the legislation within the EU to make that effective. They've been arguing to make sure that we reduce our energy charges to the industry. The government's done a bit, but not, not much. They've been saying business rates for, the, for our industries are 80% higher than the rest of Europe. Government promised, but never delivered. But in addition to that, it is about having a long-term investment strategy. We need a steel strategy. That, George Osborne said that you know, there'd be the march of the makers, we've got a long-term economic plan. Well, we're now revealing for steel we certainly haven't, and we need we needed to listen to the industry itself. Would you consider renationalisation? Well, there's areas in which governments need to intervene, and our government has said, well, we can't do that because of EU rules. My parliamentary private secretary, Andy Macdonald, has just come back from Italy. In Italy, the government intervened. They took over, they actually invested, and they've turned the situation around. They didn't wait for the Europe to tell them whether they could or not. They actually did it, and then... Actually, they've proved to be a successful. We need to be a strategic state intervening when necessary. In terms of the bigger picture, you are against the neoliberal market consensus that we live under at the moment. Do you believe in going back to some of the older policies of, as it were, pulling up the drawbridge, putting in tariffs to protect British industries when the economic storms are at their worst? Well, across Europe, let's take steel as an example. Across Europe, there's been a debate around Chinese dumping. And now we now know the dumping of steel from China was as a result of that state subsidising their steel industry. So across Europe, we've now got a consensus that we need measures to protect our steel industry from that sort of dumping policy. So with those forms of protections, if we can get agreement across Europe and introduce the appropriate regulation, well, I support. But of course, we've got to compete in a, in a global market. And the only way you can compete is by investing in the future. The problem with this government, it's cutting public sector investment. We've got the lowest level public sector investment now in the G7 apart from Canada. Mm. And the Canadian government has now changed. What are they going to do? £10 billion pounds worth of investment. Let's turn to, to the, the party, if I may, mm. because you said at a speech at Momentum last night that this is the, mom the, the biggest moment in British politics, the, the corbyn Macdonald moment for a more than a century. What did you mean by that? I didn't mention the Corbyn Macdonald moment. No, I, I don't know. think there I, is such I, a thing. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm okay. I didn't want to personalise it. I'm paraphrasing. I, I, I meant this, is that Jeremy Corbyn's campaign started off, we were booking rooms for 100 people to turn up, and 500 and 1,000 and 2,000 people were turning up. All of a sudden we realised there's a new generation and some of the older generation want to be re-engaged in politics. For the first time, I think in generations, there's a, there's a demand for politics to be open and democratic and engaging. And I think that's really exciting. I think it's terrifically exciting. The problem that you've got, however, is there's a huge disconnect between the ideas and the energy of that movement that brought Jeremy Corbyn to the leader of the Labour Party and the parliamentary party, which is, as it were, unreformed and largely untouched by that. How do you deal with that disconnect? Well, I don't think it is untouched by that. In the debates that we've been having in Shadow Cabinet in the Parliamentary Labour Party, 
people have been saying that things have changed. We're not completely sure how it's changing, but we've got to be part of that change. And there's a real willingness of the new politics, yeah. open discussion, debate. But you, but you also know there's a lot of unwillingness oh, yes. there as too. There's a lot of very angry people. Simon Danchuk saying he's going to run as a, a stalking horse yeah. candidate against Jeremy That's Corbyn. That's Simon being Simon, isn't it, really? And there'll be, there'll be people who well, have, to have to come to terms with the change and they'll do it slowly, but they will. Perhaps more substantially, because there are a lot of, as it were, moderate or centre Labour MPs who are really, really worried that when the boundary changes come, the oh, new yeah. movement will push them out. Um, I'm going to just show you something which Frank Field has told Sunday Politics. This is Frank Field talking yeah. about that. Let's have a little look at it. There will be a, a large group, I would hope, in Parliament of MPs who will, if colleagues are unfairly treated, encourage th their colleagues to stand in by-elections, to uh, stand as independent Labour candidates, and that a large number of us including myself, would go and actually campaign for them. Now, that's a capital offence, campaign for somebody standing against the, an official Labour candidate, but if enough of us go, they can't pick all of us off and expel the lot. Frank Field on the Sunday Politics this morning. What do you say to that? Frank's a friend of mine. We've been working together for 20 years. Let me tell him and every other Labour MP, we are opposing this, any threat to individual MPs. We are not in favour of reselection of these MPs. The democratic processes in the Labour Party will take place on the Boundary Commission in the normal way. Jeremy Corbyn at the last Parliamentary Labour Party made it clear that the existing rules on selection and reselection will, will be carried out in the same way as the last Boundary mm. Commission. There is no way that we will allow MPs to be deselected in that way. We will work together on this. But surely we've got a new party out there, lots of new members of the party who think, see the world much more as you do than perhaps as, uh, as other Labour MPs do. They're going to get their chance to replace MPs when the boundary changes come. And you must want a, a Labour Party in Parliament, but which more represents the kind of movement that you are talking I think, about. I think we're radicalising the Parliamentary Labour Party already. People are becoming involved in that debate. They're going back to their constituencies mm. and they're being accountable to the new membership as well as the old membership, which is great. And politics is changing in that way. But under the, under the, boundary, commission, under the boundary change rules, existing MPs have the right to be selected for their particular constituencies. The only time that will change is if two MPs are coming up against one another. You, ha you have said in the past the Labour Party has never been a socialist party no. and this is a momentous moment for the party. Is this the moment it becomes a proper socialist party? It will always be a broad church between socialists, social democrats and other social reformers. It will always be that. I think we're winning the socialist arguments more and through the democ democratic procedures yeah. of the Labour Party we'll debate our policies and then we'll unite and we'll, we'll defeat the Tories at the next election. One of the things that scares people about the current leadership, if I may say so, are some of the advisers you've brought on board. Mm -hmm. Seamus Milne worked for The Guardian for a long time. He's now head of communications and so forth. He said that, for instance, the killing of Lee Rigby on the streets of Britain wasn't a normal terrorist offence because Lee Rigby had fought as a soldier. So most people watching this programme, hacking someone to death on the streets of London is a, is, is a terrorist offence, period, simple, straightforward, and end of that. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do agree. It was a terrorist offence. Of course it was. When Seamus Milne is taken on, he'll be reflecting the views of the party overall and the party leadership. That will be his job and he'll do that faithfully, I'm sure. What about Andrew Fisher then? Um, uh, the, the Benn family have been good friends of Jeremy Corbyn and I suspect yourself for many, many years. Emily Benn, standing for the Labour Party, was opposed by Andrew Fisher, who was standing for class war. Now that should... No, he'd, look, look. Well, he wasn't standing, he was supporting no, what class happened, war. No, he wasn't supporting class war. What he did is a couple of satirical tweets which were challenging an anarchist standing in that constituency, saying, what's an anarchist standing for an election for? And, and he's a supporter. An Andrew, I know worked in constituencies right around the country over the last three elections. He toured around campaigning for Labour. He's got a record of campaigning in every marginal seat that we put him in over the last two elections. He's a Labour Party, he's a Labour Party member, true and true, right the way through. So the, these are the people around you. Nonetheless, to a lot of people, it seems a slightly strange group of people. Um, I mean, Seamus Milne has a long record of, of backing what Putin's been doing and so forth and being highly critical of the West, including over terrorist attacks and 9-11 and so forth. Are you really sure these are the kind of people that you want around you? Well, they're people with independent views in the past, but they'll be serving the party it's overall. Everyone. And we've got a vast range of people, policy advisers. I've set up, okay. for example, an Economic Advisory Council, which has Nobel Prize winners. We will be drawing on the best brains in this country and globally to advise us and assist us in policy development. And all the policies will be democratically determined by the Parliamentary Labour Party and our conference. 
John McDonnell. I'm not absolutely sure who I'm talking to here, because I've been <laughs> following you over the years, and you've been talking about insurrection, you've been man of the hard left, you've been very, very critical of the Tories. You said you'd swim through vomit to vote against them. You said lots and lots of things, and here you are, you sound terribly moderate and terribly... Now, are you hiding your real views, or have you actually changed as a politician? I'm the same socialist as I've always been, but I think you've been reading the wrong newspapers, and when people hear us on live TV like this, they see we're human beings, decent people, who want to work in the interests of our people and our country, and that's what we're doing. John McDonnell, for now, thank you very much indeed. Well, Nicky Morgan is still with me, and joined again by John McDonnell, and tax credit remains the, the issue of the day. Uh, John, you said at one point you felt physically furious sometimes when you saw Conservatives like George Osborne with these kind of policies. Here you have Nicky Morgan beside you, <laughs> oh. uh, roundly, roundly defending tax credits. I said it about MPs in general, actually. Yeah. I said, look, we're relative, well, we are very well paid. And for us to be talking about cuts to some of the poorest, but also middle and low earners, is just unacceptable. Now, Nikki, I think, is going to be one of my allies behind the scene because she knows that the school t teaching assistants, for example, they're going to lose 1,300, 1,800 pounds, some of them. School secretaries, 2,000. Behind the scenes, Nikki's going to be one of my allies that convinces George to turn on this issue. A basilisk face, though. <laughs> <laughs> and there's well, many I, more of you, I, I, I know. To, I expect to be called many things, but I'm not sure <laughs> one of your allies on this. But I just want to ask you, I mean, I think in 2013, you wrote an article in which you said that tax credits were basically subsidising bad employers. Yeah, and so are. I think you agree so, that tax we, credits have, no, to, that's be, why I agree have with, to be tackled. No, but that's why I agree with George Osborne in terms of lifting the minimum wage, but he's not lifted enough to have a real living wage. But the problem with this is his lifting of the minimum wage, there's a transition period where people will lose out. That's why the Lords are sending it back to you to say sort out the transition period. But they're not going to send it back. If they follow the motions tomorrow, then actually they will kill well, that, uh, that statutory Well, they'll put it back to the uh, government to say think No, it isn't identified. unprecedented. You haven't identified where the 4.4 <laughs> billion is going to come from. It isn't unprecedented. That's the first thing. Secondly, they're simply saying, think again about this, and we'll help you think they, again if you they, want. If they kill it and off then tomorrow. thirdly, we will say to you, stop cutting the taxes for the rich and make sure you use that money to protect people, middle and low earners and the poorest on the tax credits. That's but you all must, we're you asking. must accept, look, you look at the budget red book, you can see that actually the, 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 the richest are paying the most in terms of rebuilding our economy, which is very much more needed ta you're ta after, cut, You're ta after. cutting inheritance tax, you've cut the tax for millionaires, you're you also cutting corporations. have been in housing uh, look, You must accept that I understand that I want to see tax cuts in the end, but when the economy can afford it, and I do not want it on the back of some this of the poorest classes. This is one of those interviews where I could just amble off for a cup of coffee and a breakfast and come back at the end. Yeah. Um, but I have to say to you, I mean, you, you're sounding so moderate and so gentle, John. I mean, you did say you used to want to get physical with these people. You have changed, haven't you? Well, no, I get, I get do get angry still. You do? I get very angry still. But what I'm trying to do... Is, is keep it calm. Well, just also, I've never, I've never let, allowed my politics to become personal. This is always put politics and anything else. But I think there are people within the Conservative Party, and I think Nick is secretly as well, who side with us. And if we can convince George to change, I've said to him, look, as I said earlier, if you change, we'll not make political hay out of this. We just want what's best for the country and for people. But, but if, he, if he does change, that would be a massive, massive blow to his economic no, policy. No, it, he would, it, would be, it would be effectively the end of his chancellorship. But the Prime Minister, be very it? clear, we, the, the policy isn't changing. You have to accept, John, that it must be right that people keep more of the money that they earn. Yes, it's recycled through the system. But I think employers should pay enough. more. I think right. employers should pay more, a proper living and wage. And you want a living wage mandatory. That's, that's right, what's I coming do. in. But that no, is it, isn't a, in. it isn't a living right. wage. That's the first okay. thing. We're but also, there's this is transition period where people lose out. And the tax threshold is We are running too. out of time, but I would say that everyone who's watching doesn't actually need to sit through the Commons or the Lords debates <laughs> anymore on this. You have had an absolute pitch-perfect, miniaturised version of the debate. Thank you both I very much. Now, first this morning, let's talk about the Labour shadow chancellor. He's called John McDonnell. He appeared on the Marshall a little earlier. He revealed he's written to the Chancellor, urging him to reverse the government's proposed changes to tax credits. What do you make of the demeanour of this new, moderate, reasonable John McDonnell? That's right, and a professor in U-turn politics. He was very, <laughs> very bruised by that U-turn on the fiscal charter. And, and clearly, you know, this is somebody who said he would wade through vomit, I think, to oppose uh, these cuts, is now being reasonable and saying, if you give us a U-turn, George Osborne, I'll be nice to you. Now, he's not going to get a U-turn, but what he is going to get from the Chancellor is a 
change of tack. It is pretty clear, big expectation in Whitehall, that once we've got those votes out of the way in the House of Lords tomorrow, George Osmond will indicate that in his autumn statement on the 25th of November, he will soften the impact of the cuts. He won't change the specific policy, but he will sort of tinker around the edges. But in order to achieve that, the House of Lords cannot vote for this fatal motion, which they won't because it's a Liberal Democrat one, but equally they cannot vote for the Patricia Hollis, former Labour Minister, her one which would delay. What they've got to do is vote for the Bishop's motion, which is a regret, regret motion. If they do that, then the Chancellor will indicate that he's going to soften the impact. What do you make of the, the demeanour, though? Do you buy it of Mr McDonnell? I thought the most impressive thing I've seen from any Labour politician since Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader in September was that performance. Mm -hmm. It was delivered more in sorrow than in anger. And so if you were a reasonable Tory MP wavering over whether to support these tax credits, had John McDonnell turned up and behaved in the very shouty and pugnacious way, laying into the government on a, on a moral angle, then you would have sort of um, done the natural thing and, and uh, regressed towards supporting your own government. But instead, he made it as easy as possible by behaving as magnanimously as possible to corral opposition from conservatives, from liberals, from people on the Labour side against this, uh, against the tax credit, credit policies. I wonder whether that becomes something to look, for, look out for, an, ele an element of political deftness and subtle touch that we might not have expected from quite a ideologically committed shadow chancellor. He's already done that. I thought he's embarrassing, 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 embarrassing. Was very elegant too, actually. Yeah. Uh, Except that was played against them. This won't be played against them. No, it won't. But the point about it is if you make a bad mistake, you're better off apologising and U-turning. Refusing to U-turn gets you into worse trouble in the long run. Mm. Perhaps as the Chancellor may be about to find <laughs> out.